about programs and services that we found particularly helpful in serving rural communities. And the first is mobile daycare. And of course, it sounds like um, the old bookmobile from the library, but it's not. It's actually the staff that moves from one area to the other. And we got the idea of taking staff, usually one or two staff, and travel to a rural area, it could be 20 to 43 miles, to provide daycare in a community that didn't have daycare. That same staff might go a day a week, they might go two days, even three days a week. And you could actually have more than one team of staff, but you could also have just one staff team to do several counties within the week. We found many advantages to having mobile daycare sites in senior centers, including ability to purchase meals from centers, interaction with senior center participants, and providing referrals for persons who are no longer able to attend a senior center. Uh, mobile daycare has been particularly helpful to us because 25% of our population age 60 and older in the state live in rural areas, and coincidentally, 25% of our geographic areas in Georgia also are classified as rural. Uh, we've had five programs in one AAA region of about 15, triple, uh, 15 counties. Five mobile daycare sites have become full-time daycare programs. We also like to talk about um, care consultation program. Uh, equally supports caregivers and care receivers um, was initially developed by the Benjamin Rose Institute on aging and it was implemented in Georgia um, by the Rosalind Carter Institute and we have a great working relationship with the Rosalind Carter Institute. It's um, been very effective in rural areas as much as it was in metropolitan areas. Very cost effective, cost is $365 per year per client and we can serve between 100 and 150 persons with a full-time equivalent. Also wanted to talk about uh, two initiatives from our Alzheimer's State Plan because they also support rural caregivers. The first is distance learning for physicians, which is training to help physicians recognize and diagnose Alzheimer's disease. The training could be done either online or in the comfort of an office, and it may be done in more than one sitting. And we recently um, just finished work on a portal to collect anonymous prevalence data information. And how this ties in, of course, is if, if you know where the people, where the prevalence rates are, uh, it'll help us with our uh, position, our resources, and develop the workforce where needed to achieve greater urban rural parity. And we actually have a workforce development subcommittee of our Alzheimer's State Plan. Next, I wanted to talk about REACH, which was mentioned earlier this morning, implemented by the Rosalind Carter Institute. Um, Twelve sessions held face-to-face -face or by phone over a six-month period. Uh, success is achieved through a combination of individual and family counseling sessions, support groups, and ad hoc counseling. And a key lesson we've learned uh, through the REACH programs is that the ability to connect with the care uh, giver and an understanding of the experience of dementia caregiving are more important than degrees or licensure. Um, nurses, bachelor and master level counselors, as well as dementia care activity directors have proven to be very successful as caregiver coaches. RCI, Rosalind Carter Institute, has implemented REACH in Georgia, Texas, Nevada, Hawaii, Pennsylvania and New York. In Pennsylvania, it was primarily done in the Pittsburgh area, but in Georgia, Texas, Nevada, and Hawaii, it was done primarily in rural counties. I wanted to talk about a, and highlight a program that's been around for a while, uh, Telephone Reassurance. But with shrinking budgets and expanding populations, we think it deserves a second look, especially because it can be staffed by volunteers. We had a workforce team of early, for an early onset grant, uh, early onset Alzheimer's grant, and we had 
folks from AAAs and Adult Protective Services and the Alzheimer's Association. And they all said that telephone reassurance was an affordable way of serving isolated individuals, especially those in rural areas. And we developed two different models of telephone reassurance. Uh, one of the models uh, actually uses persons with early stage dementia as volunteers to do the calls. That model is done in a centralized setting where you have supervision on site. And the second model uh, was decentralized, which a lot of us are familiar with, where you have calls made from home. And that model did not utilize persons with dementia. Uh, lessons learned from working in rural areas. If they don't know you or your people, they're not going to trust you, and they may not even work or talk with you. So you've got to find a local trusted person who is well-connected to help you publicize and legitimize the program. Another lesson learned is that accepting help, especially for daycare or respite, may be viewed in the community as, well, you know so-and-so, she's just a bad spouse, or that's not a very good child if they're going to do that. That is a huge problem we ran into. So what you've got to do is you've got to do community education. You've got to let the community know the risks to caregiver health. You've got to let them know that if you provide respite services, the caregiver can continue longer in their journey. And what will happen is you will change attitudes and perceptions in the community to where those services do become acceptable. You've also got to know where to look in rural areas to find uh, people. And uh, uh, grocery store on discount day is a great place um, to know where programs might need to be held. And with our health and wellness programs in our rural areas, when your first persons in your community complete the program with a good experience, their comments in the community garner more requests and referrals than any other kind of marketing strategy you can possibly do, and it will bring people in. Especially in rural areas, uh, people don't always identify themselves as caregivers. So when marketing your programs, you really need to keep that in mind. Um, again, they just think, well, I'm a good child or a good spouse. So we all use the term caregiver, but many times, even if we're teaching a powerful tools for caregivers class, we will have other language in our marketing which says, are you caring for someone? Not are you a caregiver? A lot of people just don't know they're caregivers. We've also found it very beneficial for local hospitals um, to have a program there because in rural areas, that's where folks go to eat lunch. Um, and again, word of mouth is helpful, but community calendar sections of newspapers are great. But above all, you've got to find the champion. And if you have the champion, you're on easy street. We're lucky in Georgia to have what's also called care nets. And these are coalitions of family caregivers and health care professionals. It doesn't matter whether you're working with aging caregivers or those with chronic uh, diseases or other disabilities or even children. Care nets were the inspiration of former First Lady Rosalind Carter. And in each of our 12 AAAs, we have a care net. And they're usually coordinated by our AAAs. Uh, care nets are invaluable in serving rural areas. Future Directions, uh, a web portal we've recently completed. Um, this is primarily um, done to divert consumers who can access services on their own to free up and take staff for other callers. Uh, another thing we've just done is the Georgia Telephone Support for Seniors app. Um, you know, everybody doesn't like the emergency response button. We got one from my mother. Did she want to wear it? No. It interfered with her jewelry. So what we've got to remember is you've got to develop a variety of programs and services because one size doesn't fit all. So the ERS is great, but it doesn't always work. But with this app, you can program to be called every hour if you want to. And if you don't respond, that's when three other people get a call. And I've got a friend who lives in Atlanta whose 77-year-old mother lives on a rural uh, area and a big farm, and there's no one nearby, and he thinks she's going to go for the app. She won't go for the ERS button. That's too much pride if she goes to the grocery store and forgets to take it off her neck, but she does like the idea of the app. So we've got to have and remember 
we've got to have options for people. Uh, lastly, um, we have two other things. Self-directed care, I think we need to have increased emphasis on that. Everybody um, knows in rural areas you um, don't have as many providers, and if you do have a provider, a family may have had a bad experience with that provider. So I think we need to, uh, to work on more self-directed care, and we have that in our Medicaid and in our um, non-Medicaid programs in Georgia. Thank you.